this is our day and this is our time. And to be honest with you, I'm gonna need you to get a little bit of a Sicilian mindset because a Sicilian mindset looks at things differently than an American mindset. And I know I'm here for American counsel, but Tanner may not know this, but I'm a dual citizen. So I have Italian citizenship and US citizenship. I have two passports. I have a blue one and I have a red one. So I'm gonna talk to you from an Italian, Sicilian woman who is a mama and a grandma. That's a Nona. I'm gonna talk to you because I believe that we need some mother voices in the house of God. We don't need women trying to sound like men or men trying to sound like women. We need women to be women and we need men to be men. And we need mothers to be mothers and fathers to be fathers. And I'm, I'm just gonna stand up here right now and I wanna apologize for some of my sisters who had the audacity to call men toxic. Listen, yeah, there's toxic masculinity. No, God actually refers to himself in the masculine terms. He is a patriarch. I don't know if you understand that. He is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And he's a good father, not a bad father. And yes, there's toxic men. But I refuse, as a mother of four boys, as a wife who loves her husband, I refuse to denigrate men who are created to carry the glory of God with my words as a woman. We don't, we don't take our value as women by stripping it from the men. We get our value from God. And God has enough value for women and for men. And the truth is, yes, the church for a long time has not known what to do with its daughters. And so a lot of times the, the women have had to go outside of the church to find their voice. But I believe that we're in a new season and God is doing a new thing and it looks nothing like the old thing. And I feel like the pandemic was God just putting a little bit of a pause. You know, I'm on a stage right now, but I feel like when God puts a pause on something, it's like a closed curtain. And we think he's not doing anything. But he's like, you have no idea what I am doing behind the scenes. I am changing the scene. I am putting different people in place. I am moving things around. And you know, we got a little confused. We thought it was going to all be about election returns. But it is not about election returns. It's about the elect returning. And God says, when my people are called by my name, humble themselves. Pray, seek my face, and do what? Turn from their own wicked ways. Guys, I wish I could fix everybody else. But God's like, Lisa, you're only in charge of you. You gotta deal with your own wicked ways. Humility. God is looking for a people who will be humble in front of him, who will cry out on behalf of their nation, who will call people up rather than call them out. See, I believe that my husband has actually formed me by the love that he extended to me. When I met my husband, I had a suntan and six pack, abs, not a beer. He was a Christian. <laughs> and he looked at me and he said, I bet she'll be a great mother one day. No. No, I was a crazy person from a crazy family. I bet she'll be good with money. No, I opened a bunch of credit cards at the University of Arizona. I bet she'll do good with keeping up. None of those things. But my husband continued to speak life, destiny, strength over me. You guys, I never, ever wanted to be up doing what I'm doing. I lost an eye to cancer when I was Five. This eye is plastic. Afterwards, if you'd like to feel it, I will let you do that. <laughs> it's kind of cool. My grandkids like it. All right. But never, never thought I would ever do anything that put me up in front of more than two people. 
But I had a husband that said, you don't have the right to be comfortable when so many people are hurting. You were bought with a price. And God is looking for a people who will say, it is not about me or my feelings or my comfort. It is about a lost and dying world that needs me to be the hands, the feet, and the voice of Jesus Christ. <laughs> Pastors are burning out because the people come and they sit and they forget that they come to church to be equipped to go out to do the work of the ministry. And there are people that you will come in contact with that may never come into a church building, but you are anointed to bring the word of the Lord to them. You are anointed with words of wisdom, words of knowledge. You are anointed by the spirit of God for this season of harvest. So I wanna just give you a message paraphrase quote from Matthew chapter 10 verse 26 to 28, it says, don't be intimidated. Did you hear that? Don't be intimidated. Eventually, everything is going to be out in the open and everyone will know how things really are. So don't hesitate to go public now. Don't be bluffed into silence by the threats of bullies. There is nothing they can do to your soul your core being. Save your fear for God who holds your entire life, body and soul in his hands. The enemy wants you silent. He will pull the trump card of you're judging. You're not nice. We live in a culture that if you do not agree with everything that they say, they say you hate. But agreeing with a lie is not loving. And we are reaping a little bit of an aftermath of a church that preached truth without love. And now a culture has responded by preaching love without truth. Love without truth is a lie. And truth without love does not set anybody free. It puts people in bondage. For too long we use the sword of the spirit to beat people up rather than cut them free from the chains that held them bound. But I believe even with what we've just seen, little sprinklings, like what we saw with Asbury, and it wasn't just Asbury. There was a number of schools where the kids began to repent. Oh my gosh, repent? Yeah, repent. There's something about humility when you openly open the door and say, listen, this is something I'm struggling with, like me wanting to punch people that hurt my husband. That was repentance on a large scale. I haven't done it. I've just very uh, I've entertained myself a lot with the thought of it. And so <laughs> people said they repented of sexual things, of things they were struggling with. And the spirit of God is drawn to humility, but he resists pride. And we have to be a people who understand in a season of war, we gotta stop praying bedtime prayers. I was at a prayer meeting recently, I was in people I love and someone came in and they said they were in a full scale onslaught of the enemy. And I watched as the people came around them and they just kind of were patting them like, Jesus, just be with him be with his kids. Be with, I was like, that sounds like what I would say when I wanted my kids just to go to sleep. Be, Lord, just be with my kids. Let them just go to sleep. Let them not get up. No, I thought, no, this man needs a sword in his hand. And we need to speak the word of God as a sword in the spirit so that people can rightly divide between thought and intent, joint and marrow, motivations. I, there's so many things. I'm like, I'm totally right on this one. And then I get into the word of God. And I'm like, nope, not right. When I get into the word of God and I begin to read the word of God, not read tweets, not read memes, but when I actually read the word of God, the word of God, because it's alive, it begins to read me. And when the word of God begins to read me, it gives me eyes to see, ears to hear, a heart to receive, and a courage to speak. We are made for this day. We are made for this time. It is exciting. I would read through Hebrews 11 
about all the heroes of faith, you know, people getting cut in half, people not afraid of anything. I'm like, yeah, I want to be them. Well, it's easy to want to be them at the end. It's not easy to be them in the middle. And I get it that the little bit of knocking people off track during the pandemic. So how you chose to use those three years is actually really important. Uh, you could have just squandered it. You could have watched every single Netflix series you could ever imagine. Uh, my husband and I didn't even know there were such things as series. Like we didn't know there was like seasons and series. We were like, what? Well, my husband has a little bit of OCD, so I was like, we're watching Monk and you're getting free. John was like, I, I feel like he feels. I'm like, I know, you behave like he behaves. I mean, John would be like, with our boys, did everybody wash your hands? We're pro I'm like, I would like lick my hand just to bother him. So, but then Monk is clean. Then we started watching some other things. And maybe first season, it was great. Great storylines, great character development. We feel emotionally connected with these people because we're isolated in our house. I'm like, I'm friends. I am friends with Queen Elizabeth now. I am friends. <laughs> but then season two happens and something begins to shift and they slip some stuff in. And that's when you have to say, I I'm sorry, Queen Elizabeth. I can't be friends with you anymore. <laughs> what happens is you will never have authority over the things you choose to be entertained by. I'm not saying you won't go to heaven. Don't say I'm saying you're gonna to go to hell because you watch something you shouldn't watch. But I will say you will lose your edge. And I think that this is a time to sharpen our swords, not dull them. This is a time for us to pray in the spirit. This is a time for us to encourage one another. This is a time for us to understand what's going on and really begin to speak life. Can I do something? Can I have everyone... I think, you know, I think this time I'll include the 40 and under. Can I get all the 40 and unders to stand up? And not, I'm 40 in the spirit. 40 in real years. Okay. All right. Awesome. Okay, so I, I feel like I'm talking to Gen X. I'm talking to millennials. I'm talking to Gen Zs. I have to be honest with you. I love millennials. I love millennials. I birthed four of them. They, they are some of the most amazing people and the most confused people on the face of the earth. And, and I love Gen Z because I, I feel like they're going to shock everybody. And, and, I, I, even, and I, even like, I even like Gen X, I even like Gen X. But I want you guys to look at me. I believe you're a generation born for signs and wonders. And I believe the enemy has distracted you to keep you in a place of wondering. I believe many of you don't know what you're called to do because you are called to do something that has never been done before. And when you are called to do a something that has never been done before, you can't spend all your time looking at what everybody else is doing. This is a time for you to put down your phones and lift your gaze and look for what heaven is releasing because God wants to anoint your generation to prophesy. I'm gonna tell you it's way easier to criticize, but you are not anointed to criticize. You are anointed to prophesy. It takes no anointing to see a problem, but it takes a lot of anointing to see the problem and declare the answer. So you have my full permission as a Sicilian godmother for you to begin to seek God because I need the gift of God on your life, all right? Okay, you can sit down. Acts 2, 17 says, in the last days, God says. I just, I just love right there. It's kind of like, okay, uh, this person can say, I can say, but in the last days, God is gonna have his say. And the last days are not like the first days. Every single week, I get people sending me scriptures, 
listen, I suffer a woman not to preach or teach or have authority over a man. I'm like, okay, thank you. I've never read that scripture before. Okay, I mean, it's just constant, constant, constant. I'm just gonna tell you right now, I'm not a pastor. I'm here as a mama. And I'm a mother in the house of God. And mothers want more for their children than they ever experience themselves. Mothers are the ones that will lay down life to bring forth life. And I am here to bless not just the young people, but some of the older people. Yesterday, I got to do a Instagram Live with a 32-year-old young woman who just is brilliant. And she said, how come the older women don't want to spend time with us? How come they don't want to pour into us? And I said, well, there's this little thing going on where the older women think you don't want to hear from them. And then the younger women think the older women don't want to talk to them. But my Bible says in the last days when God begins to pour out his spirit, it's gonna be the old and the young, the men and the women, the visions and the dreams, the signs and the wonders. So in the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on every kind of people. Watch out, reform. God says, I will pour out my spirit on every kind of people. Can I just say right there, that means God's gonna pour his spirit out on people. I don't think he should pour it out on. I'm gonna be like, not them. No, no, you don't even know what they're really like. God, do not pour this spirit out on those people. I'm okay if you pour it out over here, but these people have been making fun of us for a long time. No, they don't get it. No, God says, I'm sorry. I'm gonna pour out my spirit on all flesh. I had somebody say, no, that's about the Jews and the Gentiles. I'm like, and that's everybody. Okay, so God <laughs> is gonna pour out his spirit on all flesh or every kind of people. It says your sons will prophesy. Do you see why this is important? You're also your daughters. Okay, he's kind of like, I, I know there's been a little sketch questions. I know Paul said some things that maybe have gotten a little carried too far, but I'm gonna have sons and daughters prophesy. Then he says, your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. When the time comes, I'll pour out my spirit on those who serve me, men and women, both, and they'll prophesy. I'll set wonders in the sky above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billowing smoke, the sun turning black and the moon blood red. That is the UFOs. Before <laughs> the day of the Lord arrives, the day tremendous and marvelous, and whoever calls out for help to me, God will be saved. God is saying, I'm gonna begin to shake everything that can be shaken, and whoever just calls out shall be saved. I know that because I was that. I was in a sorority at the University of Arizona. I remember sitting in the chapter room trying to work on my homework and one of the girls looks around the room, pulls me out and she's like, I need to do a little sociology quiz with you. And I was like, why did you look all around the room and then pull me out? She's like, oh, I just figured you're the most uh, unchristian person and I needed something to balance out the survey. I'm like, what? I go to mass twice a year? Like, I, like I'm a CEO, Christmas and Easter only. I get that, but listen, but I was not just... I was a heathen. I was a total heathen. And when I heard the gospel for the very first time, I heard it wrapped in love. I heard that God loved me so much that he sent someone to seek me out and to share his love with me. I didn't need anybody to tell me that I was covered in shame. I didn't need anyone to tell me that I'd been a hoe, I actually knew all of those things. What I needed to know was that God's love was more. And when I heard about the love of God, I interrupted John while he was doing, like he was so excited to have a captive audience. He had somebody to preach. So I finally just said, I, I don't know what we need to do, but I wanna do this Christian thing right now. And he was like, I'm not done <laughs> preaching. I was like, what? He's like, yes. And then I started to panic because I had seen the end of 
an iconic 70s movie. Uh, I hope they don't bring it back. It's called Thief in the Night, where people that aren't Christians get beheaded. And I began to think, this guy's gonna disappear in that rapture thing, and I am going to be beheaded. That's all I kept thinking about. Now the fear of God started to come in. And uh, John prayed with me, and he said, now you're saved. And I said, what does that even mean? And he said, well, it means you're whole again. Spirit, soul, and body. And I said, so I can have cheese now? He was like, what? I said, you just said that I was whole again, spirit, soul, and body. I have lactose intolerance and I am a Italian. I need to eat cheese. So now that I'm a Christian, I have cheese, right? And he was like, oh my gosh. So he grabs my hand and he was so nervous. You know, of course I've got to hear the backstory. He was like, Jesus, basically, if you can save this heathen, you can heal her. And he just had me basically repeat a prayer. He, was, he couldn't even remember what I had. He just had me say, Jesus, thank you for healing me of. And I said, lactose intolerance. And he's like, that. And I felt this warmth come into my body and untie all the knots that had been in there since I was 15. I sensed the presence of God. I sensed the goodness of God. I went back to my dorm room, spent about an hour and a half looking for the book of Paul because John had said, Paul said this, and Paul said that. And I was like, there's gotta be a book of Paul. I had a New Testament way Bible. Thank God for the Gideons. I stood on its spine. Please open to the book of Paul. And I couldn't get it to open to the book of Paul. And then finally it opens to Corinthians. If any man or woman is in Christ, they're a new creation. The old has passed away. And behold, all things become new. I, didn't, I did not have any Christian frame of reference. But that morning, God said, the man you were with last night is your husband. I called you to be the wife of a minister. It's like, what is that? And what even is that? But see, if we'll just give God our everything, which in my case was my nothing, completely, God will take it and he will do something with it. I am the least likely person that I think God should have ever picked. I come from a family of adulterers, alcoholics, married, divorced, remarried people. My grandmother was a pioneer for women. She believed in upgrading husbands. She'd been married four times. I, I, John came from nice people. I just remember his mother being like, oh my gosh, we've never had divorce in our family before. I'm like, that's not my name. I am not divorced. I'm going to be the beginning of a thousand generations who love God and keep his commandments. And we just have to decide, are we going to be the beginning of something? Are we going to be the end? I remember one of my sons came home from Youth, you know, and you know, I'm just gonna say this. Every parent understands this. They come home from school, you're awake. You're like, tell me how your day was. They're like, it's fine. And then at dinner, like, let's talk about our highs and lows. And they're like, we're not doing this for you. But you know, they might do a little bit here and there. But 10 o'clock at night, they want to unburden their soul. They come in, they're like, I need to, and I'm like, what? I've got nothing. I tried to do this at three and then again at five and then... No, you, what the Lord is saying is go to bed. That is what the Lord is saying to you. And he, I had to stay up. We live in, Col in Colorado at the time. There'd been a blizzard. I had to make sure he was home safe. And he came home from the youth group. He had this little scroll in his hand. And he was like, so they used our names and they drew pictures. And, and I was like, awesome. I'm like brushing my teeth. And he rolls out his scroll. He shows that his name is Alex, A-L-E-C. I'm like, okay, I see an eagle. That's awesome. On the E. And he's like, rolls it back up. And he looks at me. He said, mom, what do you think I'm called to do? And again, I just wanted to say, go to bed. That's what you're called to do in this moment. That's obedience. But I heard the Holy Spirit say, don't you dare paint a world too small for him. I said, Alexander, I believe that you're going to see up close what your father and I only saw in the distance. Alexander, I believe you're going to speak out loud what generations before only dared to whisper. 
I believe you're going to lay hold of with your hands the things I've only handled in prayer. I believe you are for signs and wonders and miracles. You are not for death and destruction. I believe that we have a generation that is for signs and wonders and miracles, and they are not for death and destruction. And I have, a, yes, hallelujah, I have an example from the Old Testament about the caring people who were afraid for their wives and their children. And God said, okay, the ones that you were so scared of, you know, like, what about the giants? It's so hard to be a kid right now. It's impossible to be a parent right now. God's like, okay, I'll take your kids in, but you guys are gonna wander in the wilderness until you die. I'm sorry, I want last days. I wanna go in together. And that means I'm not going to strip the next generation of their promise. And I'm also, as an older woman, I'm not going to withhold the lessons I've learned the hard way from them. I had the incredible privilege to minister in a church in Singapore where the average age is 22. They have probably about five or 6,000 people. I'm like, how are you keeping your church so young? The pastors are in their 40s, but you know, they're all just young and they believe in discipleship, discipleship, discipleship. So a 25-year-old's gonna mentor a 22-year-old, a 22-year-old's gonna mentor a 20-year-old, a 20. And so we, we asked them, we said, tell, tell us how you did this. And they said, well, we look at the youth differently than you look at the youth. And I said, okay, how, how do you look at it different? They said, we understand that the youth are our reinforcements. You see them as your replacement. And when you see someone as your replacement, you will not invest, with them, invest in them the way you will if you understand they're your reinforcement. You want to train them, you want to unpack everything that you wish you had learned when you were their age. And I, I was doing a podcast and somebody asked me, they said, what do, you, what do you see as the future of discipleship? And I said, well, all the questions have changed. I said, I used to have the young girls say to me, hey, uh, how do I pr prepare a sermon? How do I uh, get speaking engagements? How do I write a book? How do I get a book contract? And I said, they're not, they're not asking me that anymore. They're asking me, how do I stay married 40 years? How do I raise children who love God? How do I stay in love with God? How do I finish well? They are desperate for the wisdom that is on the mothers and the fathers in this house. And I just want you to know, even if they act like they know everything, just because they can download apps that you can't even find, just let you know, they are still looking to you for your wisdom and we need it. Okay, I'm gonna read a couple of scriptures and I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna go through three points. Please don't exit the room until I'm done with point three, okay? So I'm gonna open up with Romans chapter one, verses 18 through 20. And I'm gonna read it out of the message paraphrase. It says, but God's angry displeasure erupts as acts of human mistrust and wrongdoing and lying accumulate as people try to put a shroud over truth. But the basic of reality of God is plain enough. Open your eyes, there it is. By taking a long and thoughtful look at what God has created, people have always been able to see what their eyes as such cannot see. Eternal power, for instance, and the mystery of his divine being. So nobody has a good excuse. Did you hear that? Everything in creation declares the creator. The stars, the mountains, the ocean, a newborn baby, everything in creation. All you have to do is pause, lift your eyes, look. John and I were 24 and 25 in 1984. Not the book, but in real life. And we had this incredible privilege of hosting a, 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 just a pioneer in the faith. This was a man who had been a missionary in the Philippines, and he, he was like specializing in deliverance. And he said, tomorrow morning, I want you and your wife to meet me at the hotel for, at 7 a.m., well, I mean, I'm 24. I don't meet anybody at 7 a.m., but I thought maybe I have a demon. I probably need to go. So I'm gonna go to this breakfast. I was even scared, like, what does that look like at breakfast? We're sitting there, and he just begins to 
impart some stuff to John and I. And he said to us in 1984, I see a day coming where people's lives will be controlled by a box they hold in their hands. You know what I thought? He's seen up. I was thinking box, like, you know, a Christmas present, like a box. Look at your phone. Look at your phone. People are bowing to a world they can hold in their hands. They are saying the posture of people are changing because of the screen time. Their heads are down. When God says, lift your eyes and put this world down. Every night I put my phone down, I say, good night, pretend world. May you find Jesus. And I go to bed. I don't, I'm, these are not the people that are gonna be at my deathbed. These are not the people I'm gonna unburden my soul to. These are not the people that have the right to wound me. These are not the people whose words should matter more than my husband's, more than my children's, more than my daughter-in-law's. My time with my grandkids is more important than my time with my social media. And you need to have the same mindset. Those people who are strangers, it's like a coliseum. We are back in the Roman days where there's a coliseum and there's gladiators and there's spectators and there's the powers that be. But you need to stop participating and you need to step outside of that and see that God is doing something. It goes on in Romans Chapter one, verse 21, it says, what happened was this. And I love that he said what happened was this because I'm always like, what happened? How did we get this crazy so fast? And God's like, okay, I'm glad you asked. What happened was this. People knew God perfectly well, but when they didn't treat him like God, refusing to worship him, they trivialized themselves into silliness and confusion so that there was neither sense nor direction left in their lives. They pretended to know it all, but were illiterate regarding life. They traded the glory of God who holds the whole world in his hands for cheap figurines you can buy at any roadside stand. Guys, when we as a nation acknowledge God, but don't worship him, this is what happens. Because when I choose to worship God, I bow my opinions and guys, I have strong opinions. I can't, I have good opinions. I type my opinions out. I show them to my husband. He's like, you need to delete that. I share, I share my opinions with God. I'm like, but you think I'm right, right? I don't know if you've ever come to God and ask him to be on your side on something. He never chooses sides. He never chooses sides. So we've traded a life of worship for a life of foolishness and confusion. He goes on to say that women didn't know how to be women. Hang on, I'm trying to find it. I went a little bit farther. Hang on. Uh, refusing to know God, they soon didn't know how to be human either. Women didn't know how to be women and men didn't know how to be men. Did you hear that? I kind of skipped a couple verses. Okay, so if we go to Romans 1, 24, it says, so God said, in effect, if that's what you want, that's what you get. It wasn't long before they were living in a pig pen smeared with filth, filthy inside and out, and all this because they traded the true God for a fake God and worshiped the God they made instead of the God who made them, the God we bless, the God who blesses us. Oh yes, worse followed, refusing to know God. They soon didn't know how to be human. Women didn't know how to be women. Men didn't know how to be men. Sexually confused, they abused and defiled one another, women with women, men with men, all lust, no love, and then they paid for it. Oh, how they paid for it. Emptied of God and love, godless and loveless wretches. Now, a lot of people, when they read that, they immediately just think it's only talking about same sex. But that's not talking about only same sex. That's just one of the symptoms of when God says, okay, you wanna go your own way? Have your own way. And we've come to this place where this is our culture. And God is saying, it goes on in verse 28, 
And again, we've added the reality of our God. This is the reality of our day. We're not stopping here. It says, since they didn't bother to acknowledge God, the people that said, we don't want you. We just want the cheap, fake God. God quit bothering them and let them run loose. And then all hell broke loose. Rampant evil, grabbing and grasping, vicious backstabbing. They made life hell on earth with their envy, wanton killing, bickering, and cheating. Look at them, mean-spirited, venomous, fork-tongued God bashers, bullies, swaggers, insufferable, win I did not write this, insufferable windbags. They keep inventing new ways of wrecking lives. They ditch their parents when they get in the way. Stupid, slimy, cruel, cold-blooded, and it's not as if they don't know better. They know perfectly well. They are spitting in God's face, and they don't care. Worse, they hand out prizes to those who do the best things, the worst things best. Here's our day. I've actually heard some ministers say, I, I, you know, it's, a lot of things are unclear. I'm like, no, actually, it's, it's, it's pretty clear. We're just right back at the early church of Rome. And this is why Paul was writing to the Romans. And what was then is back now, where we have lived self-indulging, self-centered lives. And in refusing to worship God, we worship self. So that's not very fun. But here's, that's our, our world. Now let's talk about us. Romans 2, 1, because nobody goes to 2. Romans 2, 1 says, those people are on a dark spi spiral downward. Dark spiral downward, yes, yeah, says that. But if you think that leaves you on the high ground where you can point your fingers at others, think again. Every time you criticize someone, you condemn yourself. It takes one to know one. Judgmental criticism of others is a well-known way of escaping detection in your own crimes and misdemeanors. But God isn't so easily diverted. He sees right through all such smoke screens and holds you to what you've done. You didn't think, did you, that just by pointing your fingers at others, you would distract God from seeing all your misdoings and from coming down on you hard. This is New Testament. You d or did you think that because he is such a nice God, he'd let you off the hook? Better think this one through from the beginning. God is kind, but he is not soft. In kindness, he takes us firmly by the hand and leads us into a radical life change. Okay, I'm gonna stop there. I'm gonna talk about when God took me firmly by the hand. I already told you I had no Christian knowledge. I knew nothing about God, but I had cassette tapes. Yeah, that's how old I am. I had cassette tapes. And I remember I drove from West Lafayette, Indiana, back to Tucson, Arizona, listening to preaching, making up for 21 years of just ridiculous life. I walked into my sorority. They're all like, Toscano is here, let's party. I'm like, I'm born again. They're like, what? You're born again? That's impossible. I'm like, and I'm healed. They're like, no. And I'm called to the ministry. They're like, what just happened? I figured I had to go all the way out if I was going to be able to maintain what had happened to me two weeks earlier. I was only born again for two weeks. And I went back to my college campus. And I remember I began to pray. I began to walk the halls at night and put my hands along the walls and I would call my sorority sisters out by name, out of a kingdom of darkness into a kingdom of light. Because when God has taken you firmly by the hand, not just when you're holding his hand, and you invite him to lead you into a radical life change, not just, well, I don't want to die and go to hell, but a radical life change right now. People are drawn to you. I remember I started having knocks on my door. I heard you used to be wild. I heard you used to be mean. We heard you used to be a hoe. And now you like Jesus. I'm like, all true. We want what you have. I'm like, oh my gosh, I don't even know how to pray for somebody. I remember I was like, sit down, close your eyes. And I found my Campus Crusade track and I like put it under my leg, read the entire, made them repeat the entire thing. I was so scared I was gonna leave something out and they wouldn't get saved. And then the peace of God would come into my sorority room and they would say, what am I feeling? I said, oh, darn it, that's the Holy Spirit. I'm gonna have to pray with you to get the Holy Spirit, aren't I? And then I would pray with them. And here's the thing. 
there was Christians that were cultural Christians. And then there was crazy me. And I did not get persecuted by the heathens. I got persecuted by the cultural Christians. People started saying, you can't just pray with people and they get saved. I'm like, really? Because I feel like that's what the Bible says. They'd be like, you know, no, you need to, you need to like do a lot more discipling before you can pray with people. And they're like, I'm a Christian. I'm like, you're a Christian? You gotta be kidding me. You used to come into my room and ask me all the things I did in gory details the night before. You never told me about Jesus. You knew I was hurting. You're a Christian? That gets you in trouble. Just gonna tell you that right then. That was not wisdom. And prayed in tongues in the shower, prayed on the rooftop, prayed for sorority sisters to get healed, had words of knowledge, words of wisdom. But you know what? It didn't really come home until they actually saw the most radical change in my lifestyle. I remember I was studying for a ridiculous amount of tests that were all happening at the same time. I had a stats final. I had uh, like accounting final and like some other final. And I'm cramming, stayed up all night. And there was like three of us that were all, you know, uh, prepping for these exams. And one of our sorority sister walks in and she was like, wow, you guys look like you've been run over by a car. I was like, you need to just keep moving. You just need to keep, go get your breakfast and just keep moving. I didn't say that, but we're all like, thank you. We're, we're studying right now. You're an elementary ed major. You need, to, you need to go. You're not doing stats. You're not doing organic chem. You need to, you just need to go. But she got her tray and she just sat down. She sat down at the table and then she just kept pushing it. And I don't know how it happened, but before I knew what was going on, I said, why are you such a beep in the morning? And the whole room froze. The born again had just cussed. They all looked at me. I'm freaking out. Kelly looks at me. She's like, I knew you weren't a Christian. And she storms out of the room and everybody looks at me and said, I was bothered to say the same thing. And I stood up in front of all of my sorority sisters that were there at that breakfast with about 30 girls. And I said, I am the one who is completely out of line. I had no right to say that. And they said, that is actually the moment they knew I was a Christian because I humbled myself, because I owned a mistake. We will all make mistakes, but we don't get to make excuses. And the world actually knows how we're supposed to act. And they're watching and waiting to see the transformation in our life. People are so desperate to be whole right now. We have a culture lying to them and saying, if you change from being a boy to a girl, then you'll be whole. Does anybody remember junior high? Do you remember how awkward it was? If somebody had come to me in junior high and asked me to self-identify, I would have said I was a unicorn. I would have said I am a mythical creature. I have no idea. You don't ask people going from childhood to adulthood to do things that change the entire trajectory of their life. And it is not kind to tell people they're a mistake. What is kind is telling people they were made in the image of God. And we have to actually begin those people to be those people who live out truth and love. Truth and love. So here's your big buildup. You can ask Jesus to hold your hand and he will do that for you. But I have to believe the people gathered for American Council aren't just content with a handhold that they actually really want Jesus to take them firmly by the hand and lead them into a radical life change. If that's you, can you stand to your feet? I just want you to stand to your feet right now. And can we just lift up one hand? Just lift up a hand. I want you to say, Jesus, I'm ready for more. I'm ready for you to take me firmly by the hand and lead me into a radical life change. I am not content 
with living in compromise. I am not content with seeing just nominal signs. I believe I am alive today for signs and wonders and miracles. Put a sword in my hand. I refuse to pray bedtime prayers in a time of war. So put your word in my mouth and anoint me with a spirit of boldness. Forgive me for being intimidated. I forgot that we can't be heroes without a battle. I am here for this. Now I'm gonna pray for you what I prayed for my son. May you see up close what others saw in the distance. May you speak out loud and with love and courage what others only dared to whisper. May you lay hold of with your hands what generations past only touched in prayer. You are for signs and wonders and miracles. You are not for death and destruction. And I break the curses. I believe the best days are yet before you because God is gonna use a perilous time to birth courageous people. We're gonna know the truth and the truth is gonna set us free. I wrote a book out there called Adamant, Finding Truth in a Universe of Opinions. Guys, you don't get to have your truth. We can have stories. We can have things that are true of, like what was true of me last year was I had five grandkids. Now I have six. I'm hoping in five years I'm gonna have 10. So true of will change, but the truth does not change. And Jesus is the truth. He's the way, he's the truth, and he's the life. And no one comes to the Father except through Him. But He says, come, all of you who are hungry and thirsty. Tanner said it earlier. He's, he's like, you're feeling the edge. And He's saying, come on, don't hesitate. Just come. He says, come, you who have nothing, and I will give you what your soul longs for. So many of you, you are trying to find out who you are by looking at people. Well, you don't discover who you are in the presence of people. You discover who you are in the presence of God. And there are moments in the presence of God where God will whisper something over you that will uproot something that was planted in you decades ago. I need you to practice the presence of God. You can do it in your car. You need to make space for God to speak to you because God wants to speak to you more than you even want to hear from him. But we're gonna to have to open up our ears, put down the phone, turn off the TV. Oh, I get it, I get it, it's easier. It's easier to be distracted. But God's like, this is not the time to be distracted. This is a season of high alert. This is a time for us to understand what's going on and understand that God chose us for this time period. We should be excited that he trusted us with a season that is so punctuated, light and dark. We live in a time where evil is called good, good is called evil. Actors, people who pretend, there are cultural monitors. No, we need to have our voices back, but we start with ourselves. So may you live lives that merge both truth and love. So this is a book that's out there. It is strong. I wrote it in 2017. I had no idea that we were going to become a universe of opinions. But I believe that if you allow the truth to have its way with you, you will grow stronger and you will actually become more of who God created you to be. It's been my honor. It's been my privilege to speak strength and life into the American Council. Tanner, I'm so proud of you. I believe that God is increasing the anointing on, on your life, that he's opening doors over your life, that God is gonna bring people who are going to see the gift of God on your life and they're gonna come around it. They're not gonna just finance it. They're gonna actually help uh, be like mentors and fathers that are gonna speak into this. And I just believe this is a seed of what God is going to do in the future. And thank you for your faithfulness in a hard season. 
Thank you that you didn't give up in a hard season. Too many people paused when God was saying, hey, I know the plans I have for you. They got entrapped in the enemy's scheme, but God has always had a plan, even when the enemy had a scheme. Thank you for leaning into that plan. And I do believe that America will once more serve the living God in Jesus' name. Amen.